welcome to Talking Art. I'm Jane Trigere. We're sitting here at the Deerfield Arts Bank and we are continuing our conversations with local artists. Today we are talking to Lorianne Visaki. And um, we also will be looking at a lot of her work and talking about her technique. And, but I'd like to begin, Lorianne, welcome. Thank you, Jane. Happy to be here. I'm going to like, I'd like to begin with, are you local? I am. I'm from Hadley, Massachusetts. Oh my goodness, I'm shocked. <laughs> we, you know, many people move here, so you've just been here and stayed here. No, I spent 20 years in New York City after college, uh -huh. but I have returned. Uh -huh. And were you in New York City doing art? I was. I, I certainly but you was. You were acting too? Huh? Mm -hmm. uh, a very short-lived career acting. Short-lived career acting. Mm -hmm. I had many jobs, many hats. Many hats. Uh, so 20 years in New York City, did that turn you into an artist? What, what, what made you become an artist? So I had a dream that I made this painting. And I woke up from the dream and I went down to Pearl Paint. Really that's, big. That's a big paint place in New York. On Canal Street. And I took everything out of my wallet and I bought eight tubes of paint and two canvases. And I scurried home and I got to work and I tried to make a portrait. Started right in there with the portrait. No, I didn't have any Based on the dream? Based on the dream. And it didn't meet my expectations. I was expecting a masterpiece. Uh huh. So I turned it towards the wall and I studied acting and didn't paint again for quite some time. Mm. And then one night I turned that painting back around and I spray painted it and it started to come alive. And I took the remaining tubes and I got very expressive with As it. As a portrait? I changed the portrait. Oh, yeah. it was no longer a portrait. No, we broke up, so it was. <laughs> oh, oh, I see, I see, I see. Sorry, I didn't mean to. No, <laughs> and it became personal. an abstract expression of it, this piece. Uh huh. And is it, it here? No, it is no, not. It's not here. Okay. No. Does it exist still? It does. It does. Mm. And I continued to work on this piece, and then I thought, okay, I'm established. I'm going to go take art classes now, and I went to the Art Students League. And you didn't start at the bottom, you started right at the top. With Bruce Dorfman, a very famous painter who's on his 50th year celebrating teaching at the Art Students League. He's in museums and galleries around the world. But this was a little while ago. This I'm not asking your age, but it wasn't, it wasn't two weeks yeah. ago. No, this was almost 30 years ago. Uh -huh. And the, for the audition, you had to bring in two pieces, but I only had the one. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so I quickly worked on the other. And I went down and I put them up on the easels in front of Bruce and he looked at them and he liked them and he said to me, Lorianne, you make consistent choices in your work. And I liked that and he said, I'd be happy to have you in my class. How interesting. <laughs> wow, that's the, that's the uh, follow through of your convictions and a little daring, more than a little daring I think. Well. They were interesting pieces, let's put it that way. I uh -huh. didn't get much done in his class. I just continued to work on that second piece that I brought in. Um, and I didn't. I only stayed one semester. Oh. I thought that was enough. I, I, had yeah, yeah, that's I got it. it. I, I yeah. got it. I got, I got it. Now. Oh, good. <laughs> well, you're a brave person. So, so is there something here? Are we, are we going to work in chronological order, for instance? When did this triptych come along? This is something that I worked on, I started perhaps five or six years ago in the winter. It's a very large piece, it's about 10 feet long and 5 feet wide. It is a triptych, so there's three pieces, and I started on the one in the middle. And I was going through dental surgery, so if you look closely you'll see tiny little teeth throughout it. Uh huh. Well we only have one piece. I'm, um, here, but on the image, everybody will get to see all three, because there, Lorianne works in very large sizes. So um, dental. Yes, but it, it's really under the title of the piece is underground, and it's my idea of what it looks like if you slice earth, earth, 
five feet down, this is what it's going to look like. There's stones and rocks, there's some trickling of All water. orange? It's burnt sienna. I like. I wanted to use a warm palette. Hmm. And there's some white rocks on the top to show the top layer, and then you slice through and you get the... Were you in New York when you did this? No, I did this in my house. I didn't have an art studio yet. He here in... in uh, uh, I live on Lake Viola in Shoots Ferry. Oh, very nice. So I destroyed one of the rooms in the house by making this. Uh huh. Paints everywhere, paint all over the floor. It took the entire winter, and that's all I focused on. So, that's one of my older pieces from being in this area. I is it? Is it? Um, does it hang so normally someplace? It is in the cathedral ceiling. It's big, so and it, in your it, house, in my house, and mm -hmm. it commands a view. And so this is acrylic. Yes. So tell us why why you went to pearl paint. Did, did, are you just you started with acrylic, so you stayed with acrylic, or is there something you like particularly about acrylic? I tried everything. I tried oils, and they're not very forgiving. I work quickly. I like acrylics because you can paint over them. You can also build up with mediums. Mm, you can stick things into it, and it holds on to the paper or the coffee grounds. I love to build up texture, and you can work with acrylics that way. Coffee grounds? I add coffee grounds, sand, scraps of paper, anything I can find into the to paint. To the paint. Mm -hmm. And is this, is it, it, this piece has some texture. Some texture. No teeth. <laughs> no teeth. <laughs> well, I don't know. You, you made a point of the dental, so I'm. They're in there. I'm wondering. You'll see them. <clears throat> so from there, you went to this uh, next piece. It also has three parts, but it's one painting. Yes. It's also. Um, it's also quite large. Um, what, it, what is this about? This is called Three Brothers. Ah, I see. And it was a commission piece. Uh, the man in the middle came to me and said he wanted to do something uh, as a tribute to his two brothers that he's very close to. And he had a big flat in San Francisco a, uh, out of a warehouse of cement dark wall. He wanted a lot of color. So I knew the, th the three of them, and they are all engineers. So I, inside of their bodies, I try to make it look like there are gadgets and gears and all the things that would an engineer would need in his kit. And took their faces. So it, it's obvious. When you look at this and anybody in their family looks at this, they, they immediately see the brothers and know which one's which. They know which one's which. Absolutely. But this only one painting, so it sits in one of the brothers' right. houses. The, right. ones who the yeah. one who commissioned The one who commissioned They fight it. over it, but he bought it. I see. <laughs> I see. Well, he commissioned it, so he gets it. Oh, well, this is impressive. That's, that's, is that early, early on in your career? No. Okay. That's a few so, years ago. A few years ago. Okay. So one of the things that, if, if an artist will allow me, is to ask, what is the struggle, the economic struggle? I mean, does one survive on one's art? Or can one? Or if not, what do you do? To, well, to make, I mean, we've had people here who are accountants and, and teachers and lots of different things. It, it, it may not matter, but, you know, are, are you getting to a point where you can, you can make a living from your art? I am getting to that point, and I hope that end point is someday very soon and <laughs> happens quickly. Uh, I'm, I've been very patient. I do have other jobs. Uh, but I am also currently selling and exhibiting locally and doing uh, commissions for people who have seen my work and say, oh, okay, do my cat. Oh, I have a bison farm. Can you paint some buffalo for Okay, me? well, that takes us to the oh. next one, <laughs> oh, right? Good, good segue. I think that must be <laughs> why. And, and, and uh, <clears throat> did they also want a colorful painting? Because this is a blue bison. They left it up to me. Uh -huh. Actually, they... They didn't know they were getting a couple of paintings. I just went into their space and saw empty white walls and went home and did it and then brought them in and they loved them. And they bought them? They did not. Oh. No, they hung there for free. And then they went out of business. So. Yes, do you I want know. them? <laughs> it's four by five. It's not as big as the other ones. It's, it's gorgeous. And so this is not an engineer. So what did you decide to do here? There's a stained glass quality to it. Tell oh. me about that. I enjoy when I'm painting, uh, I sort of draw the figure first in ink, 
and then I apply a few light washes. But th what really intrigues me is the small detailed work. So I work a piece at a time. I work on the rump, and then I'm on the belly, and then I'm on the face, and then I bring all the colors together. But I like making very Klimt-esque squares and circles, and that gives me the depth that I'm looking for. So do you start a, with a base of a, ba a color and then work out of it? Sometimes a life. In or you're putting it together like a mosaic. Is it like a mosaic? Certainly, certainly. I, as I work piece by piece and as they, the pieces begin to spread out. I could see this translated as a beautiful window. It's quite colorful. What is the, what is the material that you were paint, painting onto? That's canvas. And okay, I stretch so they're my not own so canvas. So they're not so heavy. No, and that's a poplar frame, a handmade frame with tightly stretched canvas. It's very lightweight for its for its size. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. So um <coughs> Uh, some of the, I'd, I'd like to point out this piece back here because I think it sort of fits in to this category in an odd way. This is also kaleidoscopic, um, but it's not quite the stained glass window we had effect. What is going on here? What is this? Because <laughs> it looks like a collage. I'm not quite sure. It is a collage. Good. And on. I'm looking, you know, it's something is stuck onto something here. So this is MDF board, not canvas. It's, this is my very first attempt at this style. It's a poured acrylic medium. Now what is that? When you work with acrylics, there are a lot of products on the market to mix into the acrylic paint. To Besides get it, coffee grounds? Yes. <laughs> to make it thicker or more translucent or uh, everything that you need, it's on the market. So what I've done, well, let me back up. How did this happen? This is a happy accident. When you paint, you squirt out all your paints on a palette, and that eventually dries. And you can pick it up with a razor blade and peel it off, and you've got an acrylic skin. Oh. So I had been, I've been collecting those over the years and throwing them in onto a tray. They will stick together. You have to put paper in between, wax paper. Then I got the idea, well, why not do it intentionally? This has been a happy accident, but oh. let's manipulate it. So what I've done is pour out some acrylic medium, squirt a lot of paint into it, and pick up, I work on glass or plastic, and manipulate it and move it around, and then let it sit for a few days. Peel it off and start a piece. There are over a hundred pieces in this. The, the, the direction that I then go in is to integrate it together by painting on top of it to make it look as if it's almost one piece. Oh, so you've painted on top of this. The dark lines, the, the, the dark shadows. Lines. Oh, it's marvelous. And it's, it's got a lot of movement to it. Again, Absolutely. It's underground, molten lava. I'm not quite sure. It's, it's, it's got, looks like a sea creature. I'm not sure. But it I doesn't, love it doing doesn't it. Yes, no, no, no. <laughs> this, is, this is wonderful. So, <coughs> so with that, let's move on to this other technique. And this one here, we have the, some of it behind us, and uh, some of it here in front of us. Um, and you're working on, well, these are the largest ones I see here, but the small pieces that we have are so meant to be, for want of a better word, collaged together, or hung together. Is that correct? Yes. So these squares that we have here, and we have one on the screen, I think it's red, um, but you have them in different colors, and one behind you, which is a teal color. Tell me what's going on with these. They'll ultimately all go together in this uh, multi-20 uh, piece uh, panel, which I think will go up on the screen so you can see. But meantime, let's go back and tell us how you create this. So this again is MDF board, three quarter inch. MDF board is composite. And I work with joint compound. This is stucco. I, the coffee grounds weren't enough. I needed to build up more texture. So I do a layer of stucco on it. And then I carve in and imprint either with a stencil, a Lego, a coffee cup, a saucer. A or a leaf. A leaf, a are those, doily. Are those, are those imprinted with real leaves? Some of them are real and some of them I've etched in on mm -hmm. my own. And add the vines and let it dry. 
then I varnish it because I'm about to add paint and I need to have uh, it. A non-porous surface? Well, I'm going to add a lot of paint and then rub it away. And if I did it directly on the joint compound, as I rub, I'm going to rub some of that compound off. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I varnish it first, then I do the imprint, then I varnish again, and then I add one light color and rub it off. And then I add darker colors and rub it off. So you, you're left with the dark and light spaces. And mottled. Yes. Yeah. And that gives it more So texture. it sounds to me like you tried it the other way and you, it was a trial and error. You saw what didn't work, so you, you figured out that the I varnish would do. A lot of mistakes. A lot of mistakes. Isn't that the best way to learn? Yeah, exactly. And then I frame it. This is a three inch poplar. Nice piece of wood to keep it sturdy and keyhole the back of it and hang 20 of them together. I'm never satisfied with one or two. I, I love three. Six is preferred. Nine really makes me happy. And 12? 12. 12. Well, you're hitting the roof. Yeah. Mm. So this is part of a 20 uh, panel installation. And in this 20 panel installation, which we're sh we don't have here, but we're showing on the screen, each panel or is a different color, but also different leaves, different, uh, this one has, are they all vegetation? They're all leaves, a flor uh, floral motif, and, but I don't just stick to that. I have uh, other. Well, here we have something <laughs> else. Right behind you is this diptych. Um, and you have these. I think this goes with this. Yes. Could, well, could you explain what you've done so here? So behind me is, again, MDF board. It's the stucco treatment, as I just referred to. But differently, uh, what I'm doing differently is taking these Iranian batik wood blocks. These I found at a tag sale. And at a tag sale. And I. I never <laughs> see things like this at tag <laughs> you sales. You have to look. <laughs> they were made to do batiking spreads. I don't even know how to batik, but what I do is put a lot of water on them, dip them, uh, make the surface of the joint compound, and then press in. <laughs> I don't see this one here. No. No. Okay. So, right. And in this, I have one that's very, they're from Iran, so this is a very Persian looking uh, type of print. And I went so far as to look up some Farsi and etched it in. I found a, a romantic poem, I can't remember what it is, but I, I scrawled it in with the head of a nail. And the colors, though, are really very special. So here you're playing, after you've done your, mm, your texturing, can I call it texturing? Then you're free to start playing with the colors. And this teal and orange and yellow, uh, you have a very strong palette. You would start with the yellow first and mm -hmm. then wipe it off. You wouldn't start with a dark color because you can't add the light onto it. And then I would add the orange and the red and wipe it off. This was all yellow ones. This was I, all I red mm -hmm. ones. But I have to remove color. As much as I apply, I remove. A and then your last colors are the darkest. The dark. And if I wanted this to even pop more, I'd have a, add a burnt sienna to give it a lot of detail, depth. Oh, it would catch all the edges. Yes. Uh-huh. <laughs> so these are magnificent. Thank you. Yes. Which now takes us to, um, so these are the pieces that we have here. These are about 12 by 12, I'd say, and, and, and they're yes. architectural. What, what is this? Um, it's a, the same technique as the relief. Yes. But from my, I travel a lot, and I went to Pompeii a couple of times, actually, and I was impressed by the remaining frescoes and mosaics and the paints the paintings on the walls. And I loved the okra, the pumpkin, the deep red color. And I decided to try to make it look like Pompeii on these panels. Try to make doors and frames and uh, facades. So now this is freehand drawing. There's All still some tricks where I, you can see Legos pressed into one of them. Oh, uh-huh. Lego bricks. But then I uh, scroll, scroll around the door and add what I saw in Pompeii, the images of a uh, palm tree, 
something circular was above the door. It had the person's name or their business, but it's all faded and destroyed. So I didn't want to make it too obvious. And I used this, the exact colors that I was seeing. That you were seeing. So we're looking at the colors that you saw. Correct. And in the intention is, how many pieces are there in this? This is a thing? series of 12. And uh, you could... At, you could hang them on the wall, is that yes, the intention? Yes, they're lightweight. Just uh -huh. You can put six together or nine, but my vision is to have all 12 stay together. Well, of course. But they don't have any particular order to put them in? They do, but it's up to the, the purchaser, the viewer, to any of this work can, can be, be exchanged. Right. And I do custom work, so if you have a particular idea, a wedding gift, I can do them all in black and white and silver. If you have a newborn baby, I can do pink and blue and carve their name, their birth date into it. So it's... I'm willing to work with. Uh, yes, the I understand. Oh, that, that's really that's very interesting because so not every artist is willing to do that. Many people will say, "No, this is my vision, and this is what I want to do." To be able to step out and say, "I'm willing to interpret your vision," or "I'm more willing to work with you." That's that's brave too, frankly. It's a way to become more marketable. I see. Yes, well, that is a Unfortunately, you have to think about that. <laughs> <coughs> so this last one here, we have two of a, of a triptych again. Um, and this is a circus? Yes, this is a very large triptych. It's bigger than the underground one that we showed in the beginning of the program. And It didn't start off that way, actually. It, a lot of my work is, uh, has been covered up. Sometimes there's two or three paintings underneath it, and that's certainly the case with this. So I already had a lot of texture. And I started painting the squares in the background that you can see. And then I wanted to have some imagery, and I started to do the pillars and the oblong and geometrical shapes coming out. And then I saw a circus, so I added the acrobats, and they are performing over a trapeze. The third piece has uh, horses on it that you would see in a circus. And I made this. I didn't have a target in mind. Uh, I thought it would look great in a children's hospital because of all the bright colors. And you, when you're sitting in a waiting room or in the hallway before you have to go for your procedure, you would see this bright, colorful, happy thing and uh, maybe calm the child down. So, so how tall is this? I believe it's six feet. Approximately and six it, feet. And it goes it's about nine or ten feet. It depends on how far you want to space the paintings apart. Oh, you oh, can put but three it is, inches. It is, but they do flow into each other, don't they? Exactly, and that's how I work together. I have them be one continued piece and then separate them. Uh -huh. I work with all three so on the wall. you need to have your work shown because this is very hard to see big pieces like this, and especially multi-parts. You need big gallery space to show this kind of stuff. You could knock out one of your walls. <laughs> well, it actually occurs to me that they could be almost freestanding, much like the panels that we have here. Mm -hmm. We could put hinges on them. <laughs> and oh, what, what, what is that on? Is that on canvas? That's also? on canvas. Again, a homemade <coughs> poplar frame with a stretched canvas. Uh -huh. hmm. So how long does it take you to do this kind of work? I'm always working on more than one thing at one time. Sort of like... I hope you have a bigger studio. I have a very la nice large art studio. Good. And it's like when you're reading a book, I, on my bedside table I have five or six different books. So I, I can do that with artwork too. Uh -huh. if something's drying, something's not motivating me, I move to the next... But always acrylic, yes? No, I work in very many me different well, mediums. Well, we're going to move to the next <laughs> one. We're going to move to the next one. And the next one is, looks like found metal. Yes? Yes, mm. absolutely. OK, but, but you do s very interesting, odd things to them. The one that we have right here behind me is part of a, 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 a triptych again. And we have one in front of us, one behind me, and the other one is going to be shown to you on the screen. And you mean for them to be all together. And what are they called? Builder, builder, boxer. Builder. So what do we have here? He's a builder, bodybuilder. He's a bodybuilder. 
Yes. Yes. And then the other builder is. Shall I pick it up? Just no. No. Just okay. So the other builder is. He's digging. Yeah. He's digging. Building something. And the one that's not here, that's on the screen. He's the boxer. Yeah. And all from scrap metal. Right. Do you make it look rustier than it is? I find it rusty, and then I you sometimes it? manipulate it to give it a uniform patina. How do you do that? With metal paint that has iron flakes in it, and I actually use an activator that makes it rust. Most people try to not get rust, and yes. I try to activate it. Uh -huh. But for the most part, these are found objects that are already rusted and thrown away and junk. So over here, you've got something that um, I'd, I'd like you to explain to us. So this is a five by five canvas over wood. Oh, this is a canvas? Yes, yes it is indeed yeah. a canvas. Yes. And I have my friend, the joint compound. I spread it on, and then I stick what I call my rusty bits into it. Let it harden. This one's not painted yet. And I believe you do have one to show that has them all together. But we also have uh, to put on screen a larger unit of this kind to, to show. This is but what are you aiming for? I'm curious about the inner workings of machines, clocks, and love gears. And I want to see if I can recreate that with my found objects. So this is going to be part of an assemblage that will be the inside of a clock. The inside of a clock? Mm -hmm. Well, we're pretending. It's, it's not really a clock. If I have 10 more pieces around it, and after I do this initial stage, then I will paint it, and then I will weld other pieces of onto rust it. onto it. These and are, is that, is that, that welded. Um, is that, okay, now I think we have to go for this last piece here. The is inner work, you call it? Inner work. Oh, that's why. Inner work of a clock, inner work of a something. Mm -hmm. I see. But it's also my inner work. So now, oh, <laughs> I, yes, okay, it works. And again, we've got um, 12 pieces, mm -hmm. and it's very heavy. It's 50 pounds. That's it's hung with very good wire. And um, the, the, now, how do you get, okay, so you start with this. How do you get the color behind it and not affecting the metal, the rusty metal. Very carefully. Oh, carefully. You paint carefully, yes. And there are your, seems to me, your favorite colors. Teal and orangey things. And rust. So there they are. This is, this is very familiar, hmm. familiar colors for you. Rust and teal. And those are put together. I started off just by doing four together, and then it wasn't enough, then six, then nine, and I had them I'll place down on an oblong board, and I want. I, it needed more. It needed to look like the inside of a clock or a machine, and to me, it does. Uh, I put the different colors on. I use a interference with my paint, which affects the light, so it becomes more luminescent behind it. So then you have this old what, what rusty is it, what stuff. What is an interference? It's a medium that I oh, add another, to my paint. Yes. Another, where does one find these things? Art stores. <laughs> so around here? Sure. Where or, would you? Or I buy online. Uh huh. But I go to Michael's a lot. They have a very good paint department. And, and does the uh, the Guild in Northampton? Sure, I've been there as well. They have this kind of stuff. Yes, they do. Oh, okay. So we can we can imitate. We can understand what you're doing and then try our own versions of it, yes? Sure. But I don't but think I could do this. This is wonderful. You need to also learn how to weld, which oh, is lots Oh, welding. Of fun. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> but you know, I quite like the piece that is um, all white as well. I find it j appealing in a, com in a completely different way. Um, you you wouldn't it, leave it that way? No, though. I have. I've because you like layering. No, I've done a minimalist piece with uh, things that I found in the automotive shop. So I was using lug nuts and grinding wheels. And that is just white and brown. It's uh -huh. called gracefully masculine. And it's, uh, I think it might appeal to a male buyer because it's Gracefully masculine. Exactly, not so colorful. Well, these are gracefully <laughs> masculine. <laughs> yes, they are. Yes. Um, but I think what you were looking at is, an un is the stage of 
these right. before I actually yeah, right. color them. Right. So. Well, um, you've covered a lot of ground, and the work is magnificent, and, and I, uh, I really admire your bravery. That's what I come away with. Your, your, your willingness to try things and to be very mm -hmm. self-confident that it, it will work. I am actually quite, quite blown away by that, starting from your beginnings with that uh, shopping spree at, uh, at the paint <laughs> store. And I'm sorry that that first painting was not a success, but I think it led to a lot of beautiful, beautiful work and very large work and it's a, a pleasure to have it here and to be able to show it to people. Thank you so much, Jane. It's been really nice talking with you. Um, we have been interviewing Lorianne Visaki, and her work has been uh, the, the, the topic of our last half hour. I invite you to let me know if there are questions that I'm not asking of the artists that you would like me to ask, and I'll see you next week. This is Jane Trigere. This is Talking Art. We're at the Deerfield Arts Bank, and next week we'll be speaking with someone else. Thank you.